Welcome to the CHCI Leadership Conference Breakout Session. Here to lead Young Latino Leaders for America. This session is possible due to the gracious contributions from our sponsors, Planned Parenthood Federation of America, the Walton Family Foundation, and Toyota Motor North America. Our panel chair for today's session is Representative Jimmy Gomez, representing California's 34th Congressional District. Representative Gomez is the vice chair of the House Committee on Oversight and Reform, sits on the powerful House Committee on Ways and Means, and serves as an assistant whip for the House Democratic Caucus. We also welcome Sebastián Ontiveros, the National Director of Multicultural Business Alliance and Strategy Group for Toyota Motor North America, who will provide welcoming remarks. Our moderator for today's session is Paola Ramos, a host and correspondent for Vice and Vice News, as well as a contributor for Telemundo News and MSNBC. Ramos is also the author of Finding Latin X, In Search of the Voices Redefining Latino Identity. Please welcome our opening speaker, Representative Jimmy Gomez. Hi, I'm Congressman Jimmy Gomez, and I represent California's 34th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives, the east side of Los Angeles. I just want to thank everyone who is here and participating in this year's CCI Leadership Conference. This is a moment in our history that we need everybody to participate in. Back when I was in grad school in 2002-2001, we hit a demographic milestone in the state of California. For the first time in our history, half of the children born in California were of Latino descent. And I knew at that moment that half of the children turning 18 or more would be of Latino descent, but also full born US citizens with the right to vote, the right to have an impact on the direction of this country. I say that you are the generation that I've been waiting for, the generation that's gonna shape the direction of this country for years to come. It is a generation that will help us tackle some of our biggest problems from income inequality to climate change to poverty to making sure that we have a more just and equitable society. So we want to hear from all of you and I look forward to hearing from this panel and the discussion they have because their ideas, your ideas are going to help make sure that we make better decisions here in Congress, but also from the state and local level as well. So congratulations for participating. This is a pivotal moment. If you saw the 2020 census, the country is changing. The country is changing fast, but it's not about how we change that matters. It's about how we handle those changes that matters. And I know that if we are leading the way, we're gonna make a stronger and better America. So thank you so much. Raise your voice, claim your space, and make sure that uh, you have a role in the future. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias a todos. On behalf of Toyota, welcome to the CHCI Leadership Conference and to this session, Here to Lead, Young Latino Leaders for America. I'm excited to introduce this panel because it underscores a fact that we've known for a long time here at Toyota. Latinos play a vital role in the future of this great nation, and it's especially exciting to see so many young Latinos stepping up and stepping into leadership roles throughout our society. The Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute has been a driving force in developing young Latinos as leaders for decades. As the Latino population grows, this aspect of the CHCI's work is increasingly important. It's essential that Latinos are proportionally represented at all levels of government and in the halls of power across our country. We must have a seat at every table and a voice in every decision that relates to our future. That's why Toyota is proud to be the title sponsor of CHCI's Summer Congressional Internship Program. Over the last decade, we have given more than $4 million to fund dozens of outstanding young people to work in, as interns in Congress. They gain a bird's eye view of policymaking and politics, and we collectively gain valuable leaders in our shared communities. We're honored to support these initiatives for promising young people because we are committed to empowering young people to seek greater futures, not only for themselves, but also for their communities. And when our shared communities prosper, we all prosper. 
So without further ado, let's meet our young leaders. Vayamos juntos. Hi everyone, my name is Paula Ramos. I'm a correspondent for Vice News and I'm also a contributor for Telemundo and MSNBC. I'm extremely honored to be your moderator today for this very important conversation that's titled Here to Lead Young Latino Leaders for America. Thank you, of course, to Representative Gomez and Sebastián Ontiveros for your remarks. And thank you more than anything to CHCI for providing, for always providing a platform that centers the voices of young people particularly the voices of young Latinos. And that's exactly why we're here today, right? I feel like for years we've been saying the same thing. The future is Latino. We've been saying those words despite people constantly underestimating our community, right? Despite historians looking at us with skepticism, and despite people that sort of didn't believe that, we've been saying that for years, but now we can say with certainty what we've always known to be true, right? Because that future is here. Young Latinos are the youngest demographic in the country, with one out of every four Americans under the age of 18 identifying as Latinos. And for years, we've seen what that's meant, right? We've seen young Latinos changing culture as we know it. We've seen young Latinos transforming power. And more than anything, we've seen how young Latinos have completely redefined what justice and equality mean in this country. And today we're seeing all of that come to life. And one of the reasons why we're seeing this political transformation is because for over 40 years, CHCI's mission has been to develop the next generation of Latino leaders. And this session that you're about to hear will celebrate young Latinos who are making an impact in their communities and in the country. And I guarantee you, you know most, if not every single person that is about to, to talk to us today. So that's why I'm so extremely pleased to introduce our esteemed panelists who each and every single one of them represents a young leader in their own fields. So first up, we have Greysa Martinez Rosas, who is the executive director of United We Dream, of course, the largest immigrant youth led network in the country with more than 800,000 members. Hola, Paola. It's such a, ¿Qué tal, uh, Greysa? Estar aquí contigo y con Cienca. I'm ready to do Igualmente, so happy. excited to have this conversation. All right, next up we have Gabriela Estala Lopez, who is a Raiz campaign organizer for Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains, and she's talking to us from New Mexico. Gabriela, how are you? Hi, Paola. I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I'm good. excited. Excited okay. for the conversation. Amazing. Next, we have Antoinette Gajeda, who's the editor in chief of Arkansas Soul, a nonprofit digital media organization creating content by, for, and about. BIPOC folks in Arkansas. Antoinette. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Um, and lastly, we have Representative Edgar Gonzalez Jr., who represents Illinois' 21st district in the Illinois House of Representatives, and he is one of the youngest members to hold that position. Representative, how are you? All good. Muchas gracias por tenerme aquí. Claro que sí. Um, Pues ahí vamos. Look, the, the five of us will be having a conversation, but we also want to hear from you, our audience. So as you're hearing us, please feel free to continue the conversation on social media using the hashtag CHCIHHM21. All right, so let's get to it. First of all, not for everyone, I introduce each and every one of you, but we often know that the way that the public knows you is at times very different from the way that you see yourselves, right? So I wanna give all of you an opportunity to introduce yourselves in your words and really tell us how you got to where you are today. Grace, I'm gonna put you on the spot and start with you. Dale, you know, I'm always ready. So, you know, my name is Grace San Martinez Rosas. I use pronouns like she, her, and they. Um, and I am undocumented, unafraid, queer, and unashamed. And I'm really proud and honored to lead United We Dream and United We Dream Action. We're the largest immigrant youth-led network in the country. Um, and you know, I first wanna say thank you to CHCI for its investment in changing the political landscape for growing a pipeline of Latino uh, leadership and for ensuring that uh, the voices of our communities continue to take on the, uh, the halls of Congress. Um, to know me is to know my people and my people are, uh, queer people, young people, black and brown people all across the South and Southwest, all across the US. Um, and to know, and my people are uh, my parents. 
Um, today, I want to bring into the space my mother, Elia and uh, she taught me uh, how to fight. She taught me what it was like to be, what it was to be a woman, how to be undocumented in this country with dignity. Um, and though she's no longer with us, um, I bring her in every part uh, of my work uh, because I know that, um, you know, for the lives of millions of other mothers all across the country. So uh, that's who I am, and I'm really proud to be in this such a distinguished panel. Thank you for saying that, Alisa. And we'll, you know, we're, we're thinking about your, your mother today. Um, Gabriela. Hi, um, my name is Gabriela Estrada Lopez. I use she, her, ella, and I'm the Raiz and Gen Action Campaign Organizer for New Mexico um, as a part of the Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains. Um, as the Raiz Organizer, I work to center Latinx folks in our work throughout the state to ensure that our voices are heard and are getting the information in sex education that we need to make decisions about our reproductive health care. Um, centering them when making decisions, planning campaigns, and local initiatives strengthens the movement and lets them know that the RAIS program is here to support them and, you know, myself. Um, and I'm so excited to get to work in this position. I'd never thought that I would have a job where I get to work directly with my Latinx community, for the community, and especially regarding reproductive health care and justice. So I'm very excited to be here and to... Um, get to be with these uh, other amazing panelists. Thank you. Antoinette? Hi, I'm Antoinette Grajeda. I am the editor-in-chief of Arkansas Soul. I've been a journalist based in Arkansas for about 15 years, and I've gotten to work in a lot of different mediums. And I'm so excited about this new job. It's new for me. Um, we are a new organization, and we're trying to lift up the voices of Black and Brown folks in our state historically. Um, mainstream traditional uh, news organizations haven't, um, their stories haven't been well represented in those places either by the people telling them or by um, having those stories authentically told and re representing their communities. And we're hoping to do that in this space. So lifting up journalists of color so they have a place where they can work and they feel safe and respected and valued. Um, we're also working to build that pipeline so that we have young journalists of color coming into this space. And I'm just really happy to talk more about this and with uh, the esteemed panelists. Um, and representative? Uh, so I'm Representative Gonzalez. I have been in the General Assembly in Illinois for I believe it's a year and a half now. I'm technically in my second term. I'm the youngest Democrat in state history um, in the General Assembly, and I'm the youngest Latino in state history in the General Assembly. So it's a huge honor to be able to serve with a bunch of my colleagues, a lot of people who have paved the way for people like me uh, to be in these positions. Um, you know, I think um, as everybody has mentioned, CHCI has really built this pipeline, uh, you know, has really been about it. And so I'm happy to join the panelists here today in order to talk about a little bit about our stories and you know, making sure that we keep that pipeline going. Well, I'll actually stay with you, a representative, and, and then open it up to everyone else, but simply because of what you just said. Obviously, you're, you're one of the youngest, if not the youngest, a person to hold this position in the state assembly. Um, every single one of you are considered leaders or considered young leaders. Every single one of you have these big, massive platforms with big megaphones. But we also know the other side of the story, right? This path to success isn't necessarily linear, and it's we know that it's also not necessarily easy. So so I would love to know what challenges you've faced along the way to get where you are now. Oof, pues donde empiezo? Este, I know. Uh, but <laughs> I think uh, um, from, from the very, from the very get-go, I think um, part of it was external and part of it is internal. I think the internal mm -hmm. part of it, just like, for example, I um, the college I went to was a predominantly white institution, you know, so, um, you know, being in those spaces where people just had a like a lot of money um you know it you know uh, i had like kind of an imposter syndrome and so mm. when i went to the general assembly and i am the youngest again as in, in both the house and the senate right now uh you know being the youngest it has its own like you you, you start to feel like wow pues, toda esta gente, they got a lot more experience than i do you know they they've they've like they've worked so much uh you know they've been in their communities hustling and bustling like like, what have, what have yeah. I done to be, you know? And so you kind of have this mentality that kind of hits you like, uh, like 
every once in a while. But I think another part of it is external, but it kind of falls into that um, uh, your, my youth, um, because I think a lot of my colleagues, uh, because I am the youngest, uh, you know, they, they, there comes a, uh, like, well, how seriously can I take this person? You know, what exactly do they actually know about their communities? Um, you know, what, uh, um, I mean, in, in, in general, like, you know, does he deserve to, to be here? Mm -hmm. And maybe they're not thinking of it consciously, but, you know, it's on the forefront of their minds. Uh, so those are some things that I've had to deal with uh, quite a bit. Um, actually, uh, I, I, um, I, I recall a, a few instances uh, where a lot of uh, legislators have called me cute or a baby. And, you know, this is adult talking, you know. So, I mean, that happens. What am I going to do? Uh, but, you know, I think that Do you goes respond? To show you I'll do the response. I, what I is, what turned, is one say in response to that? I mean, you're, you're I, an elected I just turned, official. I just turned completely red and I'm like, okay. Um, and then like they hold my shoulder like, no, it's not the end. Like, like um, only once has one legislator actually like, she comes back to me and she's like, you know what? Like I said that to you, we're an adult. I apologize. And like, mm. don't worry, it's okay. Uh, but in my mind, you know, I'm there to do one thing and one thing only, and that's fighting for my communities and fighting for my neighborhood, fighting for my district, you know? And if I need to handle that just a little bit in order to get stuff done, I gotta do what I gotta do. Yeah. Does anyone else have any, any similar experiences? Hopefully, well, I was gonna say, hopefully no one has been called and labeled that way the rest of you, but um, um, does anyone have any other experience like that? I've definitely struggled with my age and then as I've aged, still looking younger. Um, I've lost count of how many times I show up to an interview and someone looks at me and they're like, so are you still in school? And, I'm, mm. and I have to tell them, oh, I, um, yeah, I went to the University of Arkansas and I have an undergraduate degree and a master's degree and they kind of just stare at you. So feeling like you have to defend your presence in the room immediately, it's like not a good foot to put yourself on. So that's always yeah. been a struggle and you find ways around it. And as I've gotten older, you know, putting them on the spot instead of me, that's helpful. Um, I, th I would mm -hmm. say another challenge that I have faced specifically in my field is just opportunities for leadership positions, right? In our community, we do a lot of community news and a lot of those organizations that I've worked for, the people that have been there, have been there for decades and they plan to die there. And so there just aren't these opportunities for you to advance and there's not a lot of um, mentorship opportunities. So it's difficult to find those positions where you can lead. And it doesn't always have mm -hmm. to be the, part of the news director, right? You could be put in charge of a special project or something, but I just haven't had those types of opportunities until now. Mm -hmm. You know, as you, you mentioned, um, Antoinette, you mentioned sort of the, the folks that have been there for, for a longer time in these industries. And, mm -hmm. and that takes me to the next question for everyone, which is, you know, all of us are sort of walking in, the, in someone else's path. No, we're carrying someone else's legacy, whether that is mentors, whether that is simply those that came before us, whether that is other leaders in the movement. Um, but I'm curious what you all think is the difference in the way that different generations approach change, right? The way that different generations are approaching movement building. Um, I say this because I think, I feel like the central question that is related to all of our different works is this idea of, is radical change not only is radical change possible but there's always this subtle question of like can we even ask for that right and and so i, I would love to know how how you all are seeing these generational differences yeah so the reproductive movement has long been dominated by older white women um traditionally right. who see roe v wade as the pinnacle of, of reproductive access so in my experience it's been pretty difficult to get boomers and older generations to see the intersectionality that the reproductive movement really needs to have to continue moving forward you know as our babies know especially millennials and gen z making abortion legal is literally the floor there are so mm -hmm. many barriers to that exist, such as distance to a healthcare center, financial burden, and of course, state laws. Um, I have a deep respect for our elders who fought for Roe v. Wade and won, because that's going to forever be a historical milestone for the reproductive. But we really need to continue pushing on and addressing all the barriers in accessing reproductive healthcare through radical change. Um, the time for incremental change has really passed. 
with the latest Texas bill that makes Texans abortions everyone's business but their own. Radical change is needed more than ever. And in Texas, like many states, a legacy of systemic racism has trapped BIPOC people in poverty at disproportionately high rates, and they likely will most likely be harmed by this ban. Um, so I think that as more of Gen Z and millennials are getting into positions of power and leadership, we're going to start seeing some more of that radical and much needed change and a culture shift. Um, BIPOC youth and young people are the leaders of this wave of reproductive access and justice. They've always been. Um, and young people, young BIPOC people led the fight to getting the old New Mexico abortion ban repealed. And so that's kept New Mexico as a safe haven. And it's really been amazing getting to be a part of that change and seeing that like the youth are very capable, young people are capable of radical change and they're doing the thing, they've been doing the thing. And I think that's just been something that's been different between the two generations, um, especially within that reproductive movement. Um, Bubble, yeah, <laughs> and Greza, I mean, I know you were about to say something, but you're, you're literally in the midst of one of the biggest historic fights that the movement and the immigration world is living in this moment. And so how, what are, what are the dynamics that are going on there now? Well, you know, I'm, I'm um, before, I'm an organizer at heart, like um, the idea of grassroots organizing, bringing people together. And I think that that over the years has taught me that um, we're actually building on on someone else's dream before us. We're seven generations before us, and there will be seven generations after us of people that will continue to lock in the work. And that, to Gabriela's point, young people have a unique role and have always had a unique role in social change, not only in this country, but all across the globe. When you think, when I think about Carmelita Torres, who started the bathroom, 17, almost like 100 years ago in the southern border. When I think about the young Japanese people that were put into U.S. concentration camps um, th that said no when they were asked to provide the names and the, and the addresses of other Japanese people in living in the U.S. When I think about, you know, young people, like the movement for Black Lives, and that has been really grounded by uh, young Black people within this moment, I think that it is incumbent upon all of us all the across all generations to see our work as a continuum of um to see our work as a continuum and so as you were talking about now in the at the edge of a breakthrough and uh, mm. we will uh, deliver citizenship for millions of people um in this in this united states and that is because of the decades of work that black women did in georgia to ensure that there was a president biden in the white house that, that is um, the power of like young undocumented people and putting our bodies on the line for the last 20 years to defend, protect, and call out um, ICE and CBP and its, its awful um, impact that it has in our lives. And it is because of um, people that laid the groundwork for the immigrant. That doesn't mean that that's where we stay now. It actually means that I have way more power behind me to say that uh, this movement has grown so much that now we need to stretch. And after mm -hmm. we went to the friendship for millions of people, you know, Paola, I know that you, I've seen a lot of like your reporting and I think that you and I can also know that just beyond having papers and by seeing, being citizens doesn't mean that everything's okay. Um, right. We still face massive injustice in our communities. Brianna Taylor, um, uh, she didn't have, she had papers and she was still um, okay. killed by police. And so as we think about the challenges ahead, I think that I, I, I often feel like I need to go back and touch um, ancestors that were before me to ask them like, how did you figure this out? Because this stuff is hard. Um, and yeah. also be able to disagree with them that we are not, young people, and chanters and door knockers, we are strategists because we embody the solutions, the innovations, and the breakthroughs of tomorrow. Mm. In Representative Antoinette, what do you? What is it like for you both? Um, for, at least from at least on my end, I think um, uh, 
just like with, for I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use an example. A lot of people said during 2016 and 2020 with Bernie Sanders in the presidential race, he was able to push a lot of people to the left just because he was in the race and because he was speaking out. You know, and I think to a certain degree, us as young people, whenever we're included in these conversations, you know, we kind of push the fold a little bit more so that in the future, so that when actual change actually happens, um, you know, it's a lot more radical than it would have been if nobody had spoken up because otherwise mm -hmm. the dinosaur politics would want things to stay exactly the same and nothing okay. would change we'll stick with the status quo and we'll be stuck with it but because of but because of our perspectives because of our different perspectives um, but at the same time because of our willingness to push that envelope you know we're able uh to um yeah to create that to create that radical change sometimes it might take a little bit longer i've noticed you know actually working in the motions of the procedures and everything that things can take many many years to actually be implemented but if you don't have those people you know with those loud voices uh you know to push uh to push the envelope uh, a lot of change wouldn't happen to add to that, I would say that I think the younger generation is more willing and more prepared to speak up and to activate their community in the way that they need to, whatever that looks like. I think social media has helped with that quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, from a journalist standpoint, we maybe don't have all of the reporters of color in the newsroom that we would like, but there are, are a lot of people doing the educational work of journalists by sharing the reporting of what's happening in their community through social media, uh, issues that are important to them. Um, if there's a protest, they're letting people know, hey, this is where you can show up and this is what you can do. Um, I think that older generations and younger generations can work together. I don't think there needs to be um, a fight per se. Older generations, I think, if nothing else, we can learn from their connections. You know, they maybe don't agree with the, some of the things that we're doing, but I think, you know, older folks can sometimes be stuck in their ways, right? And so it can be harder to see something new when you've spent all this time working on this one thing and then someone comes in younger saying, oh, well, this is the better way. I think there needs to be a meeting or melding of the minds there. And one of the things I think that the older generation can do that's beneficial is they've built up a community. They have a network, you know, connect the mm. people to the younger generation, right? Because younger generation, I think, is full of ideas and vigor, but you, you have to have those connections. You have to have those people that can help you take your idea and turn it into action. Yeah, that actually was going to be my next my next question, right? When when you think of like the news or I mean, when when in all of your different fields, you know, the question as of late is always, what can I do to help? You no, know? so so it, what would you what would you tell an, an older person? You no, know, in in your different fields that is asking, what what can I do to help? You no, know, how how can how can the older generation be better allies um, to all of you? And then you you sort of already hinted at at some steps, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, definitely the old, my, my advice for the older generation, and sorry for jumping the gun there, but uh, yeah. just that they should humble themselves a little bit, you know, be open minded to hearing other ideas that maybe aren't yours. I think that's what blocks a lot of progress is people are so tied to their ideas that they aren't willing to hear other options. So I think that's a big piece of it is just being open minded and willing to listen. Hmm. Grace, I do feel like people are willing to listen. And I think that's such an important thing. I, I feel like with me, at least with age, I feel like something that I was really bad at when I was younger was listening, listening. Like I was, I was a bad listener. I think with age, I figured out that the best weapon actually that I have is when I'm quiet and I listen and I listen. And, but I don't know, like Grace, I don't know if like are, are, are older folks in the movement open and able to listen? Well, you know, when I think about older folks, I actually think about our elected officials. When we yeah. think about the Senate, the House, the White House, the majority of those folks are over the age of 60. And so I don't want to verge into the place of ageism, but the thing yeah. that I found is that they are responsible for the next 10 years of what public policy will mean for Latinos, for Black people, for women's right to choose, for our ability to breathe this air. And my, my ask of every single person that is in Congress, that is like the older generation is be, be 
unapologetic, like deliver the victories that people elected you to, um, to deliver and ensure that like, I mean, I, I like when people listen to me, you know, like I feel like all of us have like a little bit of ego that like can, it's healthy for our work. And yeah. we're not asking for a favor, like young Latino, the largest part of the electorate of the future. You just saw the census results come out and how how great, much greater the community that, that I represent and that we represent is, is going to grow in power. We know that like demographics is not destiny, but it is a thing to contend with. And so when I think about the older generations, I think about elected officials and my job in this moment is for them to know that they have a job, that they have mm -hmm. to be bold, they have to be unapologetic. And from my seat point of view, they have to deliver this $3.5 trillion budget deal. They have to deliver citizenship for millions of people, healthcare for undocumented people all across the US and, and protect women's rights to choose. And that needs to happen right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gabriela, I mean, is it is it a similar sentiment for you? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think that the older generations just need to have trust in you know young people. Like, they know what they need, they know what they want. and you know, they're great at strategizing to get to that point um, to really invoke radical change. So we're capable and we're ready. Have you all had good mentors? I feel like for me, I, I, I've had the privilege of having like really amazing mentors that I can point to that have gotten me to, to where I am now. No, does anyone have like a specific, I don't know, story about, about a mentor that looking back, you're like, wow, like that, that person really, you know, really, really helped me out. And I, I, and I say this because I think for our audience, mentorship always comes up, you know, the role of mentorship yeah. always comes up. And I always like to remind even my bosses, you know, um, how important that is. And in these busy days where we're all sort of like looking at our phones all day long, we forget about just the role of like very basic mentorships. So I'm curious if anyone has like a good story of a person that looking back really got got you to where you are in this moment. I, I'm thinking right now, after I graduated from college, I started working for Congressman Chuy Garcia, uh, who was my congressman. Yeah, and in 2015, yeah, and then 2015, he <laughs> ran for mayor and I was a senior in high school. So when I saw him running for mayor, I'm like, yo, my boy, he's from an immigrant from Mexico. He lives in the same wow. neighborhood that I do. And the fact that he's running for, for mayor, like, yo, like, that's what's up, you know. So seeing him, like, like low key, like low key, like whenever people say, like, like do you have a hero, like in, in office right now? I'm like, is that guy right there, Bigotón? Este. So you know, I think, um, like after and, and then after I graduated, I started working with him, and I started working with the organization that he has built here in Chicago. Um, that have really has really tried to activate the Black, Brown, and White uh, coalition. Um, uh, over here, I think it's just um. No, it's just a testament to, uh, you know, him, him having him as a mentor. Um, you know, every time, uh, um, every time that I've been down in Springfield, uh, many times if he remembers, he checks in. Hey, how's it going? How's this bill going? If he hears about a big bill, he checks in. He checks in with me and a wow. bunch of other legislators that have kind of come out from the same like, like you know, political circle, um, mm -hmm. like this, the progressive movements here in Chicago. So, um, you know, having somebody like him as a mentor, kind of, you know, he's like, like we are con ese, um, you can rely on this person, you know, just having, you know, having that person who can kind of like tell you the ins and outs uh, from their own perspective, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very helpful and it makes the job a lot easier. Completely. Wow. I mean, what a, what an amazing person to be able to call a mentor. Grecia, you had your, your, your hand up. Well, I was just going to talk about um, my first organizer, Alex Gomez, who now runs Lucha, which is a really amazing organization in, in Arizona. And, you know, sometimes you need someone to just like give you a little bit like, wake up, like, what are you doing? Yeah. I remember um, I had an action that I was planning and, you know, it was the best yeah. smoothest. It was one of my first ones. Like, she sat me down and went point by point about the things that like, I needed feedback on. So one of the things that I've learned I've had mentorship relationships in, in both ways is um, that feedback is important, that it's it's meant to um, to build us up and it's meant to ensure that we're stronger for the next time around. Yeah. Any Anyone else? Um, but if not, okay, so I, I started the conversations with this phrase, no, which which has perhaps become corny, but it is true. No, the, the future, the future is Latino. 
we are the youngest generation in this country. Um, one out of four Americans under the age of 18 identify as Latino. Again, I feel like we're so used to these numbers, but like it, it is an immense amount of power that we hold in our hands. And so when I say that phrase, no, the future is Latino, um, what does that mean to you all? No, what, do you, what do you see in, in that future? I see a lot of potential, um, but it all mm -hmm. depends on the action. You can have a large group of people, but if you don't do anything with it, then nothing happens, right? So yeah. um, I think I think it's important to have spaces like this where we can have the conversation about you know what it means to be Latino and like what we can do for our community going forward and understanding that everybody's stories are different, especially within the Latino community. Um, you know that's one of the things that I think I think about a lot. You know, in telling the stories of the community. You know, here in Arkansas, we have people who were born in, say, Mexico and moved here, but then you have people like me that I was born in the United States. And, you know, my dad is Mexican, but my mom is white. So I'm mixed. And so I have a very different experience than someone who, you know, a friend of mine who was born and raised in Mexico and came here in junior <laughs> high. You know, a lot of similarities as well, but just that idea that our stories are all different, you know, but we can all have a common goal. Um, and I think there's a lot that you can do. You just have to have that space to have those conversations. Yeah. Anyone, and this one I want, like, as, as, as feelings and, and thoughts flow, no? So whomever, again, what, what comes to mind? The future is Latino. What do you see? A Latino mayor, a Latino governor, a Latino president. That's what comes to mind when That's we say- That's right, representative. No, calma, 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 todavía no. Oh, yes, yes. But, and the president is called President Gonzalez. Yes. <laughs> but but what, what, I th what I think with this is that at the same time that, you know, we need to make sure that we have Latinos in positions of power when it comes to chief executives, um, you know, in, in corporations, in um, in politics, um, in healthcare, and on the set. But at the same time, to make sure, I mean, we've all heard the phrase that just because you're brown doesn't mean you're with us. You know, like we had to, we had to be sure that whenever we are putting these Latinos into positions of power or anybody, uh, you know, aunque no sean Latino, but that they are fighting for us and that they are taking us, that they aren't taking us for granted. You know, and they're making yeah. sure they're getting input from our communities. You know, and um, and making sure that they were accounted for. That's that's what comes to mind with uh, the future Latino. Mm -hmm. I think about, I think about like parties and fiestas uh, that everyone mm. can be a part of. I think about uh, like when we say the future Latino, then that means that it's queer, that, mm -hmm. that it's youthful, that there's music, that there's clear, like political and moral clarity uh, that is embodied by people. It means that we're able to articulate a shared vision um, that is accountable to uh, black leadership in the U.S. Um, and that it it is um, Paola Gabriela uh, Representative Edward that we have done the work to create the infrastructure for many others to come behind us. Um, and so I think that um, you know I, when I think about that, it just makes me like beam with joy and so with a lot of responsibility for for the work to come. I love when yeah, you say absolutely. music. I always, no, no, I, I was just gonna say like I always think about when you say music. I always, I love to say this fact to like all my like like super white American friends. I'm like, did you know that Latin music is now officially more popular than country music? Like statistically, like every radio chart will show you. And I just, I love, I love saying that. Now, did that tell me what what comes to mind for you? Oh, I was. Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, now there's seven states and territories that are minority majority, which means that like, you know, Lat Latino people, BIPOC people are, you know, in thriving communities in these states. And so getting to organize, you know, I'm seeing what everyone is saying, like there's people that are start to that are running for these leadership positions um, to become representatives. And so it's really happening at the state level. And it's really great to see. And I'm excited to see that momentum keep going until, you know, like, um, Representative Gonzalez says that we have a Latinx uh, president. That would be amazing. And just, you know, to continue following the leadership of other BIPOC leaders and just building stronger communities together. Um, I have one more question before we move over to Q&A. You know, I feel like 
and you, you say momentum, Ariela, there, there is a lot of momentum, but I, 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 I also feel like there's momentum that can go either way, you know, that can move forward or sort of take this country back. There's a lot of momentum we're seeing it, to finally legalize millions of undocumented folks, but then I also see a lot of momentum to roll back Roe v. Wade, then suddenly journalism as we know it, um, Antoine, you know this, is changing, right? Like facts are no longer facts. Lies have become sources of journalism. So everything is sort of on the brink of something. And so my question to you all is, what role do you see yourselves playing in this moment, right? In this moment in history, what do you, what do you see as your role? And Antoine, let's start with you. Sure. Um, for me, I would say I see my role kind of as educator. Like you mentioned, with journalism, lies and facts and every other fake news, one of my favorite phrases. <laughs> like, yeah. So many things happening with that right now. So from our perspective at Arkansas Soul, it seems like there's a lot of folks who just have stopped paying attention altogether because they're not being represented, because they can't tell what's true, because it's just people screaming at each other. So we're trying to mm. rebuild the models to bring those folks back into um, paying attention again, honestly. You know, as a journalist, yeah. our role is to educate the public so we have a better informed citizenry so that they can be active in their communities, whatever that looks like. So if we can build this space where black and brown folks are seeing themselves represented in an authentic way, and, and then they'll come back and pay attention and they start to know what's happening in their communities, and so they can be an active participant in their community. And I think, and also just giving them a space to have their voice heard, because that's so huge and feeling like you belong to a community and then therefore want to participate yeah. and feel like you can impact it. Because there's also the piece that people feel like they can't impact it, right? Because they don't see themselves mm -hmm. in positions of power. They don't see their needs being taken care of. And so this is kind of the way that we see it as a, a small piece of it, because it's obviously a very large issue to tackle. I think this is our contribution. Adela, what about you? Uh, I think I'm just going to be continuing the work that I'm doing and bettering it, you know, like working with young BIPOC youth here in the state and um, ensuring that we're doing everything that we can to support our neighboring states. You know, like what's happening in Texas is we're going to see that start popping up in a lot of other states. And so working and organizing together to make sure that New Mexico State um, basically as an abortion safe haven that people know they can come here and have their access to reproductive health care that is needed. Um, so yeah, just continuing to make sure that we are organizing together and protecting our communities. Um, I do not know how long I'd stay um, as the, in politics. People say that I'll probably be here until I die. Que como que no me da muchas ganas de hacer eso. Este, pero, um, you know, I think uh, at least right now, Whatever you want to focus on, make sure it is that, you know, um, many a times a lot of our young people, like they're interested in politics. They don't know how politics work or they don't know the procedures in government. They don't know the motions, how to become a law, or how to organize and how to work from the outside and, you know, pressure your legislators, uh, you know, to get stuff done. Uh, so actually um, I'm on TikTok and on TikTok, I kind of explain how, um, you know, how bills become law and what, the, what it looks like inside the Capitol because he has to see. So, yeah. At this point, what, the, the only thing I see myself doing in the future, in whatever capacity that I have, is the is um just teaching, just making sure people know what what you know what the work is, what's all about, but okay, then they can teach their um you know the next generation. I I'm responsible to do three things. Um, the first one is care for myself, um, so that I can continue to do this work. Second is. Uh, to build an undeniable um, power building independent movement of undocumented immigrant young people, queer people um, all across the US. And the third one um, is to reflect back the power of that to be brown is to be beautiful, that to be an immigrant is to be resilient, that to be a woman is to be celebrated, um, and that to be queer is to be um, love embodied. And so I, that's my, my assignment that I've given myself. Um, it's a long road ahead, but I'm really, I'm really excited that I don't have to do it by myself and that I get to do it with everyone on this panel and everybody watching us. And here, Here's the last question. Here's, here's the, the, the last final thoughts that I want you all to, to leave us with. 
No, so if, if in one sentence, no, you could all answer this question. What advice would you give to your younger self? One sentence. Looking back, what advice would you give to your younger self? What would it be? Take up space. Take up space. Just take up space. Um, I, I would say never give up and just look for the people that are going to support you. Um, mine would definitely be you are capable, you are strong, you are wise, and you know what you need. Uh, you are enough, and it'll be okay. Mm. Um, thank you. Thank you. If I, I, I was thinking about it. If I, if I had to look back, I would tell myself to come out earlier in, in all shapes, in, in, in every form of whatever my expression was. Um, but I, I always think about that. Thank you so much, honestly, to, to all of you. You're incredible. Um, Grace, Gabriela, Antoinette, Representative, thank you, thank you, thank you. And to the audience, thank you for attending CHCI's Leadership Conference. Please keep tweeting about the summit. Um, please keep sharing your thoughts. Remember to use the hashtag, hashtag, ahí va, hashtag CHCI HHM 21. Make sure to check out the plenary session, which is coming up right next. Um, and it is titled Latino Stories, New Narratives in American Media. It's been an honor to be your moderator. Enjoy the rest of the session and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you.